You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Andrew Farina. He's the head of Fearless Health Coaching. And the website is fearlesshealthcoaching.com. So, Andy, thanks for coming. How you doing? Hey, pleasure to be here, Rich. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I've noticed most people in the health field, unfortunately, they've had their own, like, health problems, and then that uh, it leads them to get into the health field. So I don't know if that's the case with you, but what's your origin story? How did you get into this area? Well, it all started when I came uh, seven weeks early, delivered to my mom, um, premature, uh, about five pounds, and uh, the doctors came to my mother and told her, you know, I'm sorry, Mrs. Farina, but your son will never walk. Right. And, and that was kind of the beginning of the story. Um, to jump ahead, I was able to finally get out of casts and braces somewhere when I was about five years old. And um, when I was six, I got out of my corrective shoes and I could walk and and they told the doctors were like, well, you won't be able to run. And then I was able to run. And then the doctors said, well, you know, let's see how it goes. And so I can remember at 14 years old, um, trying out for the high school basketball team and, you know, my knees would swell up and I had lots of problems, but just kept overcoming the problems and kept healing mm-hmm. up and uh, became a competitive um, recreational runner in college and I uh, was pretty solid and strong and went strong for a while. But when I was a freshman, I, I got, had a really bad back injury and I was back to, Oh, you know, you're not going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to walk very well. And, you know, I was like, Man, wow. it's, like a, it's like a montage of a, uh, of a bully. Well, well, you're yeah. never going to win. And then if yeah, you win, was... you're like, well, you're never going to get to the Olympics. Well, you know, they just keep, it's like a montage of people telling you, you can't, you can't, it must be really frustrating. Yeah, it, it is frustrating because I'm kind of your classic Italian, stubborn Italian. And, um, you know, I don't like I can't or you can't. And so um, I just kept working at it um, and learning. Uh, I was in college, was becoming an electrical engineer. And so I was real analytical. So I just started studying the human body and studying therapies and trial and error. And, um, you know, and then when I was 30 it happened again believe it or not and they were surprised and like oh you're not going to be able to do this you're not going to be able to do that and so yeah it was very frustrating so all right so how did you heal yourself each time i mean is there a theme to how you did it or is it uh, just motivation and i don't know basic uh, concepts you know you write i don't know are there any specific, specific exercises or mechanisms or you just uh, you just figured out a way to do it well, you know, when it comes to backs, when I had my back injury at 18, a football injury and herniated discs and, you know, it was very painful. And I was actually in pain 24-7 for a total of 23 years. So not something oh I wish on anybody. Yeah. And um, I went to nine different medical professionals, everything from neurosurgeon to orthopedic surgeon to doctors, to chiropractors, to therapists. 
and everybody has an opinion, but nobody has answers. Um, yeah, yeah. So in hindsight, looking back, there were several factors that played a key role in my healing process, which finally came to fruition, uh, came to, you know, where I could start running again um, back in about 2009. I was out of running and racing for 18 years. And during that time, I was still training and exercising, trying to find ways to deal with my back and stop the pain. Um, My legs had grown strong, but there was some dysfunction there. My right leg was anatomically a half inch shorter than my left leg. And that wasn't diagnosed until many years later. They always thought it was a functional difference, which changes the way you do therapy and stuff. Um, But I would say this. I would say... I, I, I was led to a phenomenal massage therapist that helped break up a lot of muscular adhesions, tissue adhesions, I should say, because it was the fascia also. So that was one issue. Once that tissue became adhesed, the range of motion of muscles then affected joints, which then, you know, which was irritating nerves. Um, so that was one. A second one is finding some rehabilitative exercises that worked well for me in particular. Um, So a lot of times you would get all these exercises from physical therapists and medical people, and some would move you forward and some would move you backwards. And so you'd have to try every single one and see if it was moving you forward or back. And this went on for a period of years. I think that was an issue. Learning stress management techniques was something that helped a lot because uh, stress impacts your um, musculature, you know, tightness right. and things like that. You tense up. So stress, stress management techniques. And then I just think, you know, working with your deep inner self, um, asking the harder questions of life, of what you believe and why, um, because those things can help you move forward or they could keep you from moving forward and, and, then you give up. And so back in 2009, I'd run one mile and it would take me a week to recover. And last year I ran a hundred miles up in the mountains and I was okay within Uh, a week. And so, um, uh, amazing things can happen. So now you do health coaching. So, uh, what does that look like for people? Yes. Um, as you can hear from what worked in my past, uh, it was a little more of a holistic approach. Most people, when they have, uh, at least I've been working in the health industry now for almost 30 years. And um, (laughs) most people, when they have an injury, they try to become very specific. Like, oh, if my knee hurts, there's something wrong with my knee. I must have a torn ACL. Mm. Um, Not typically the case. Typically, it might be the joint above or the joint below that's, you know, out in some way. And it's affecting that joint. So I take a very holistic approach. So I do... Health coaching, I do life coaching, I do career coaching, I do relational coaching, um, I do nutrition coaching, sleep coaching, whatever it is that is holding you back from healing and moving forward, you know, I pinpoint that with my clients and then we come up with a plan for moving towards resolution so that they could be free to heal and become who they really dream of becoming. And I know that sounds like really like, wow, you know, and stuff like that, but it's, it's very doable. It's not like just, well, how do you, uh, how do you get someone out of the mindset of like, yeah, I contacted you because my knee hurts, you know, what does it have to do with like my sleep or, you know, my job or whatever? Like, you know, how do you cross that chasm with somebody They, I would bet, I mean, they're coming to you expecting a, and then if you talk about BCD, they might be like, what, you know, what are you talking about? (laughs) Right. Great question, Rich. Um, That is typically the response. Like people come with their preconceived idea of what they need. And of course, you want to give people what they want because out of respect for them, but you also have to give them what they need. Um, And sometimes Mm -hmm. what they want and what they need are two separate things. So um, for example, my one client friend, um, I'll call him Bob just to change his name. Bob came to me and he's like, you know, I want to work on 
nutrition and I want to do it exactly this way. And so um, I was like, okay, but the way he described wasn't working very, going to work very well for his personality. And so what I did is I, I do two things. I start asking questions that will get the person, I believe self-discovery is very powerful. So I asked him, I said, okay, we're doing it your way. How's that going? How's it, you know, kind of the typical Doc Phil thing. How's that working for you? Um, are your clothes fitting any better? Are you meeting your goals? Well, no, not really. Um, so at that point, then they're much more open to other thoughts. Um, I had a, a, a ex special forces guy contact me today and he's like, I want to work on my running form. I was like, great, I can help you with that. And then right. he was, he was like, but I'm, I've strained my calf and I hurt my back six weeks ago. So immediately I start thinking, hey, this guy's getting injured. Something's not right in what he's doing. Either he's under high stress and his cortisol levels are high or, you know, his techniques are not proper. So I started asking questions. And once we got to some of the questions, I found out some things that might be leading to his injuries that is changing his gait. So we can't work on running form until we mitigate some of these other areas and see, once you give people the hope that change is coming, if we can resolve some of these things, they become much more eager to work a little more holistically versus just, okay, fix my knee, Andy, or fix my running stuff. What, um, I mean, is the solution you find typically logically linked to the, what they think their problem is, or is it sometimes like a completely weird arena that they would be like, I how are those connected? You know, how does it fall? Yes. Um, people are, you know, people are very intelligent and they know their own bodies. So I do spend a lot of time listening and getting feedback. I like to use the phrase lead with questions. And, um, and I try to encourage people to be patient that sometimes it takes as long to get out of the woods as it does to walk into them. Like there are not instant fixes often i i try to give them i was gonna ask you that is it like if someone's had a condition for x amount of time is there a rule of thumb on how long it'll take to fix them you know if i've had like you know my leg has been hurting for 10 years does that tell you how long versus like a year or you know 30 years um not necessarily which is the encouraging news um It's finding what I call the big ticket items. For example, um, one client has never been able to be consistent in his exercise. He wants to be, but has not been able to get there. And in light of that, his eating habits weren't great. And he's starting to put on quite the gut. And he's not pleased with where he's at in life with his physical health. So... I asked him what okay. he had been. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So I just asked some questions like, what are you doing for your exercise? You know, how is that working for your body? You know, so on and so forth. What aches and pains are you having? So on and so forth. So I listened, listened, listened. And finally, a couple light bulbs went off as I began to hear how he described some things. And to make a long story short, I totally simplified his training and He has literally, today I got a text from him. He texts me every day um, just because he wants to, because he's so excited that he's, he has exercised in a healthy and an appropriate way, 31 days in a row after a decade or more of inconsistent exercise. I would say that was a pretty quick, drastic turnaround. So finding people, finding people's big ticket items, whether it's for an injury or for a lifestyle choice to me is the quest you have to be like sherlock holmes all right okay i got you um do you feel like you are sherlock holmes and i'm not saying that you know ego type stuff but like what allows you to be a sherlock holmes is it just you're a careful listener do you feel like you have like a higher level of skill than other people or is it because you've been through so much pain for so many years that you're just hell-bent on figuring this out like what what's special about the way you do things well I think there's several things that aid in this process. One is, we've already said many times, listening well to your clients. That's a key skill that I find a lot in the, in 
the consulting industry and the fitness industry, they come in as experts and they dispense ad advice quickly. And a lot of it is good advice. But I think the key is giving personalized advice that's going to work for each athlete and each individual. So you must listen well. You must personalize. You know, there are principles that are consistent through all people. But if you really want to service your clients well, you've got to find what personally works for them, their personality, their background, their season of life, their life demands. You know, I coach uh, CEOs in business, life, and health who live extremely demanding lifestyles. And some techniques that I would use with um, other people, um, you know, these guys are used to being in charge and calling all the shots and 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 have very little discretionary time during their workday. You know, I cannot use the same te techniques with them as I use maybe with someone who might have a little more discretionary time. So I think part of it is listening well, personalizing for your client, and maybe the big thing is being so well researched and educated that that information feeds your intuition. Intuition is not just some magical thing that you wave a, a wand and all of a sudden you have intuition. I am an intuitive kind of person. Um, I think that's a, a gift I was given. Um, you know, I can't claim any personal credit for that. But what I can do is I can be very well researched because your your fact. Your, data, your fact database feeds your intuition. And um, also, since I've dealt with a number of clients over the last 30 years, you know, I have a very good experience repertoire that I don't want to jump to conclusions too quick, but there are things sometimes that are said and done that I'm able to jump to quickly and find out. For example, if a guy's a good athlete, I have one guy, good athlete, young guy, going strong, and all of a sudden he starts getting injured a lot. The first question I ask is, how's your sleep going these days? Oh, man, I've been under a lot of stress and I haven't been sleeping a whole lot. Well, there's no use training somebody really hard when their cortisol levels are already really high because they're not sleeping. So the first thing we need to work on is their sleep before we can get back to hard training. So okay. I hope that makes, you know, paints sort of the picture. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know what... Uh... Are there common themes with the people you talk to, or is it kind of all over the place? Or, uh, you know, what's your experience? Good question. There are definitely common themes, and um, statistical analysis supports some of these common themes. So, um, the average American does not get enough sleep, and I think sleep may be the key to health in so many ways. It's when your body repairs, it's when your mind detoxes. Um, if you're not sleeping well, it throws off your prefrontal cortex, which is your executive decision making, uh, which means then you become enslaved by what I would call your monkey mind, your limbic circuitry, which is just all survival based and very reactive. Um, so there are definitely common themes. People don't sleep enough. People try, you know, of the people that do train consistently, a lot of times their easy days are too hard and their hard training days are too easy. I don't know if that makes sense. So what I have to find is I tend to use more of the 80, 20 use where 80, 80% 80 of their training is moderate. And then 20% is like really, really hard that delivers, um, typically, uh, better long-term results and, uh, is often the model that a number of elite athletes use in their training. Um, I find out if there's relational conflict in their life, um, because that, um, and often there is, that's typically the key stressor in their life is, well, things are going great at work, but I'm not home so much. So, you know, my wife and kids are upset with me. And so, you know, if they're not relating well at home, it's really hard to stay focused at work. It's really hard to stay focused. Um, gross generality, men will try to compartmentalize, but it catches up to everyone at some point. So I think commonalities, re relational tension, sleep deprivation, um, having too much information. And with the internet and the information age, there's so much misinformation floating around or what I call truncated information. So people hear, well, I hear if I do a ketogenic diet that, you know, I'll lose weight. 
And, uh, you know, I right. hear this and I hear that. And so they're just all over the map. And so nothing really works because they're always trying something new. So oh. those are all mm-hmm. four commonalities I see often. Okay. So I guess listening, getting to the real root of the problem, but then getting a commitment from the person to try it for a period of time to see if they get results instead of just trying it for one day or you know every few days to try it, they, that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. So every client, I was just talking with a client and we decided that they needed to uh, work on their sleep. And so they had not been having good sleep at all. And they had every excuse why they shouldn't have sleep. Um, And so we talked about something they could do that would enhance their sleep. And I said, what is your level of confidence that you could practice this every evening for the next two weeks? What's your level of confidence? And they said, uh, probably about a 70 or 80% confident I can do that. I said, what would it take for you to get to 90% confidence? How about if we cut the goal in half? So you're only going to focus on half of what we just said. And I define that for them. You're going to go to bed only 10 minutes earlier and you're going to turn the lights down in your room and house only 30 minutes before before you go to bed. Okay. You're just going to do that. Are you 90% confident you can do that every night for the next week? Oh, come on, Andy. That's so simple. That's not going to help. Are you, are you 90% confident you can do that? Yes, I am. Okay. Do that for a week. I will touch base with you. And then let's try to do it again for another week. If it's moving in the right direction, lo and behold, worked like a champ. So moral of the story your, my client doesn't leave my presence in a time unless they're 90% confident they can act on what we've decided. And it's such a small, simple action. They almost think it's silly, but yeah. I know it's going to help. And so once they get results, they will be motivated and they will want to do more. So would you call that like a micro commitment or just an initial commitment or do you have a name for that? Um, no, actually, I don't ask for commitment. And um, I just said, I just asked them, would you be willing to do this? And if they can't say yes with 90% certainty that they can do it, then we keep changing the goal until it's so simple that they're like, gosh, that's just like brushing my teeth. I can do that. I said, well, do that and let's see what impact it has. And it works. So yeah, it is. It's micro goals that lead to Mm. macro results. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. And it seems so, so simple uh, that people just blow it off, but the little things turn into big things. Well, all right. So once they do these, uh, this first, you know, small series of steps, then you feel like it opens the door for them to listen to you more, and then you ask them to do more, or what, what happens from there? The process is the same throughout. Um, if you look at it statistically, um, if someone works on a habit, I, you know, I call habits the bullet, pr- the bullet train of the brain. Because they, they, uh, your brain will, as soon as it assesses a situation, will immediately try to go to a habit 200 times faster than conscious or subconscious thought. So I build habits. I do habit-based coaching. I build habits in people. So if, if people have the right habits in place, they'll automatically go to them like driving your car. And so mm. everything has to be simple and has to build. Because people tend to be already overcommitted, very stressed. That's what I find with almost all my clients is they're busy. They're very committed. They don't have a lot of extra time. So if I come in and try to give them something else to do that takes a lot of time, they're going to feel stressed. And if they feel stressed, they're going to go into fight or flight. And most of the time it's flight, which means procrastination, which means they don't get results, which means, you know, I'm not doing my job. My job is to get you from where you are to where you want to go. That's what a good coach does. So I don't have to do a bunch of convincing. What I have to do is I have to get you results fast so that then you'll keep taking steps because a journey of a thousand miles, you know, starts with steps, one step. Right. So, so whether they're deep into the process with me or they just started, it's the same thing. One habit at a time, every two weeks, we reevaluate. And through that process, uh, for example, one top CEO of a multi-hundred million dollar company that I coach 
in, um, I started coaching him in health. Now we're coaching in career and life too. Um, in his health pursuit, he wanted to lose a significant amount of weight, about 45 pounds. And um, that doesn't come easy because you have to not only, I tell people, I don't care how much weight you can lose. What I care about is how much weight you can keep off for years. And to do right. that, you have to work with your brain because if you start losing too much weight too quick, your brain will start freaking out and saying, this person's starving me. And it will impulse you a bunch on um, you know, having to eat more and stuff like that. And so the problem is people's weight just yo-yos, goes up and down, up and down. My goal is for you to take the weight off and keep it off. So I started out with, he's Mr. Go For It, you know, typical type A CEO type. And uh, so I, all I asked him to do was a 15 minute workout per day. He was like, mm. I could do 45 minutes to an hour. I said, huh? but all I'm going to ask is 15 minutes. That's it. I'm only checking you on 15 minutes. Came up with a, a good workout for him. Very simple. Can you 90% sure you could do this? He's like, absolutely. How many days a week can you do this? He says, well, I can do this four days a week. I said, you sure? I said, he says, I'm sure. Okay, four days a week, 15 minutes a pop. And then I see, he's like, I want to work on my eating and nutrition. I said, okay, five to seven minutes a day. Can you do that? I can do that. Okay, long story short, yeah, yeah. year and a half later, 45 pounds off, still off. Doesn't matter if he's getting crushed at work. Doesn't matter if he's on vacation with his family. He knows how to eat. He knows how to exercise. He knows what to do. He's kept the weight off. He's down at like 180, 185, keeps it there no matter what. Happy as a clam. Hence why then he hired me then to work with uh, some stuff in his company and things like that. You should tell people nuns have habits and so should they. That's not, that's not a bad joke for you. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it is about habits, that's for sure. <laughs> well, so very good. Um, have there been any people that, I don't know, you couldn't help or are there, are there reasons that people, even with your help, they fail and then self-sabotage or what, what goes on? You know, life is messy and people are complex. And so there are occasions um, where I'm not able to get very far with a client. Um, I can think of uh, one woman who I was working with and um, she was eager, wanted to get there. But there's three things that have to fall into place for, for change to come. You have to be ready for change. You have to be willing to change and you have to be able to change. And if any three of those are off, you're not going to get very far. And so if people like sometimes people will come to me and it's like, you need to, you know, Andy, you need to coach my daughter or you need to coach my husband. And I'm like, well, when they're ready to give me a call and set that up, I'll, I'll work with them. So they have to be ready to change, you know, where they have to initiate. Somebody pushing you into coaching is not in your best interest. They have yeah, to be, yeah, yeah, they have to be willing, meaning, you know, I'm ready to change. And what am I willing to do for change to become a reality for me? You know, what am I willing to let go? So going back to this woman, she wasn't willing to let go of Mountain Dew and a few other things. And it really sabotaged the whole process. I never told her to get rid of Mountain Dew. She knew it was sabotaging her. But she's just like, I'm not willing to deal with that. I was like, okay. Mm. She lost two pounds in a year. That to me right. would be extremely frustrating. Now, she was happy that she learned how to make choices so that when she wants to make them, she could. And then able to change, you know, are you able to, in this season to put at least some effort in and uh, make some time, no matter how small each day. So if those are in place, change occurs. If those three aren't in place, I encourage my client, you know, potential clients, please wait a little bit and then let's revisit it. OK, and that's how I operate. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. So um, I don't know, any any strange cases or any outliers of people that uh, had just really odd odd issues or memorable maybe just memorable stories memorable give a bunch of examples but yeah. yes um let me think for a moment i've i've had i've had so many clients over these years let me think um yes um i have a client had a client who really legitimately struggled with uh 
attention deficit disorder. Um, and very hard to stay on task. And so my personality uh, is very classic type A, high structure, sequential operations, that kind of thing. This client was exactly the opposite in every way, yet highly intelligent, highly caring, highly gifted, but just couldn't put it together. And several supervisors at work were starting to take notice of some of the issues and becoming, you know, upset with her. So mm. I, I settled down her supervisors and said, you know, let me take responsibility here. Give me, you know, three months and let's see what we can do. And so I would have to, uh, and I'm the type, you have to give me the headline to this, to the story before the details. And I was never going to get that in this case. So I had to really work at listening deeply into all these different tangents and things that we go off. But finally, we were informally, after a coaching session I was doing with other employees, we got to talking and I don't remember the conversation, but we were talking about this client's life and you could tell the light bulbs were going off. And, and she, she was all of a sudden seeing things that she never saw before in her own life. And um, long story short was she realized what she was doing. Now, it was entrenched. And so it's not going to just change automatically. But as we've been talking over the months, um, her supervisors have been super happy with the progress she's made and the work she's doing. Her her progress is great in the work she's doing at work. So they're giving her more responsibility. And, you know, people will possibly listening will say, well, gosh, that's not too impressive what Andy did. But, you know, what I find is that, first of all, people need time to process and need to be listened to. So that theme comes up again. And most people are too busy expensing, dispensing advice before they listen carefully enough. And the, the advice is not very helpful. My goal is to give my clients fantastic advice. If they don't do anything about it, that's their choice. But right. I need to give you, you hire me to get you to point B from point A. I need to give you great advice. So um, finding those light bulb situations, those bright spots in people's lives, that's what I need to do. And so in this case now, she's starting to take off in her career and in her personal life. Her confidence level has gone way up. Um, she's a happier person because of all that. And uh, we stay in touch and uh, good things are happening. But it, that to me was a very different case where I don't know if I dispensed a lot of great like techniques or anything like that. But she needed someone to get to point B who cared enough to sort through all the details and tangents to find what the root issue really was and then give mm -hmm. her some simple practical tools to deal with that root issue. We accomplished that and it's been amazing result. Okay. Well, that's fun. So just a couple more questions. Um, you know, there's always new technology. There's like personalized medicine. There's apps. Or tracking this or doing that. I mean, there's like, you know, high tech stuff, AI for monitoring you and, you know, course correcting and suggesting. Do you tend to use that stuff or do you tend to use like old school methods that uh, work and do they work better? Well, I would jokingly say yes. Because <laughs> I do use both. You know, coming from, a, I'm a, you know, previously a hardware designer, state of the art electronics, I love tech stuff. Totally love it. Um, I am, Old school in my some of my philosophies. Some might call it old school. I don't know. I think it's you know time tested and highly effective. So I'm yes to both of those. So let me tell you where technology is a great advantage. Um, I'm an obsessive researcher, so I love data, and so technology is great for um, providing data and bringing awareness to different things. For example. Um, I logged everything I ate using um, 
an app. There's plenty of those apps out there, food logs and stuff like that, probably for three years straight, just so I could become so oh, wow. familiar with um, macronutrient balances and how that affected my body, um, caloric values on foods, whether in the home or in restaurants, to become a complete expert on the contents of food. So the, what did you see? What did you observe? Um, first, several things. First of all, technology is good for, again, data and awareness. I don't think it's real good for solving anything. I know that people could argue with me on that. And certainly the tech producers are out there probably like, you know, want to crucify me. But um, that's where my old school comes in. What you have to do with your data and what you learn from tech is you have to personalize it for the person. And a human being's got to do that. Otherwise, it's all general stuff. Um, for example, I'm an ultra endurance athlete. I run 2,500 to 3,000 miles a year. Uh, I run all these races, you know, in the mountains. I live in Florida, so training for mountain races is a challenge. Um, so I, I have a Garmin. I like all the information I get from that. But, you know, whether my cadence is at 165 or 175 or whatever is recommended by elite coaches and athletes, you know, my body is used to a style of handling things a certain way. And yes, I can improve in certain areas and speed up cadence and so on and so forth. But, you know, my cadence is not always the best cadence for my clients. So do we just make everybody try to run at 170? Or do we take the data that we have? What are you running at right now? Say the client's running at 155. Well, that is kind of a low cadence, and that does open you up for certain injuries and gait, under gait analysis could you know impact your gait and so on and so forth in the sense that it's not as good as it could be. So let's try to increase your cadence and find a bit more comfortable spot for you. But I don't let technology and data rule. What it has to come back to is let's try this. Let's see how it impacts you. If it works, we keep it. If it doesn't work, we tweak it or we discard it. And over a period of time, you build a repertoire of things that really work well for you, and it enhances performance greatly. So that's why I think technology serves us well in data collection and in awareness. Um, when it comes to analyzing food and calories, um, honestly, besides just understanding that what you're about to eat may take an hour to work off if you're into that kind of thing, but I, I think people spend way too much time focusing on that kind of stuff, and there's simpler ways to do it. Like you can go ahead and go into counting calories, even though it's highly inaccurate. You can go into macronutrient balance um, calculations, which I think is helpful for just making sure you're building your amino acid pools and your glycogen storage and healthy fatty acids and things like that. But people spend way too much time fixated on that stuff when really if they built some basic healthy habits, those things actually would take care of themselves and you would save time and be able to put it towards having fun or spending time with loved ones and so on and so forth. So. Okay. No, I mean, it makes sense. Um, any last insights you got from tracking your you know, food intake for years? I mean, that's a lot. So do you see any, anything uh, special or weird? Or you know, didn't, didn't see anything weird. Probably the, the main interesting lesson for my personality in particular was that I could, in seasons when I wasn't in all out training, I could much more easily control my food intake to where it was at a healthy level if I was tracking because I was very aware of what I was putting in my body. And, you know, coming from my background where I came through massive injury and I started ultra running very late in life. I was 49 years old before I ran my first ultra marathon, which was a 31 miler up in South Carolina in the woods. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, older and older athlete and still competing pretty strongly and uh, against much younger athletes. So it, it really helps me to be aware of what I'm eating and how that's impacting me. Um, and so that helped me to, I don't want to use the word control, but to make sure I was eating healthy proportions because the world around us, the proportions are, 
you know, we tend to eat too much here in America as a gross generality. And um, it, it's easy to let things get out of hand. And I actually enjoy my meals more now that I'm eating more healthy portions because I savor them more like a fine wine instead of guzzling them down like a cheap beer. Um, so, um, so I think that was probably the key lesson was that, uh, you know, um, being aware of what goes into you has an impact. And so was it worth the three years for me? It was. Okay. Well, excellent. So what's the best way for listeners to get in touch and experience the magic the uh, you know the small asks to get them towards their goals. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, I love getting the ball rolling with people. Um, well, they can go to my website, which has uh, contact info there at www.fearlesshealthcoaching.com. Um, there's plenty of ways to con- there's tabs there to contact um, contact Andy, um, you know, or contact Fearless Health, and uh, that would be the number one way I suggest. They could always uh, friend me on Facebook um, at Andy Farina. Um, And so if they just want to observe, I'm usually posting stuff. They can also find my Fearless Health Facebook page. Um, And, uh, you know, those those seem to be the most, um, should I say, the way to put your toe in the water without feeling like you've got to have a direct conversation right off the bat. Because, you know, the health industry is can be a bit sketchy. There's a lot of people selling a lot of snake oil. So I give people freedom to kind of check me out for a while if they want to, before they jump right in. Hmm. Okay. Well, very good. Andy, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Richard, thanks so much. Great questions. You're a great host. And uh, I really enjoyed the time to chat. Um, dealing with a, a, a wordy um, former New Yorker Italian, you did a great job. <laughs> You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.